This is Bob Oliphant from the Westford Historical Society and Museum, bringing you Episode 8 of Season 3 of the Westford Wardsman Podcast. The Westford Wardsman newspaper was part of Turner's Public Spirit, a weekly newspaper in air a century ago. In this episode, we'll be reading the Wardsman for the week ending Saturday, February 19th, 1910. I'll elaborate on what was happening in Westford in 1910. The first section this week is the Westford Center section. The E.J. Whitney's had a telephone installed in their pleasant home last week. The new number is 16-2. Reverend David Wallace preached at the Congregational Church most acceptably um, in the morning and evening last Sunday. He will preach again this following Sunday morning and evening. Mr. Wallace is staying with his family in Lunenburg, where he had a former pastorate of six years. Reverend Charles P. Marshall went in town Tuesday to officiate at the funeral of his former parishioner, Mrs. Horace Hamlet of Brookside, made a few brief calls in this village, and reports being well established in, this, in his new environment in Quincy, near the Four River shipyards. Winter has progressed progressed enough so that the usual harvest of colds and grip is beginning to fall into the hands of our physicians. Among their recent victims to be obliged to apply for medical assistance are Mrs. Nellie Fletcher, Miss Ella Gill, and John Gill Fletcher. Miss Eva E. Fletcher has the sincere sympathy of many of her many friends in her serious illness. It began with what at first seemed like an attack of tonsillitis, but later an acute appendicitis developed. Dr. Wells and a Boston specialist in consultation and operative treatment has been deferred for the present at least, and at this writing the patient is resting quite comfortably. Master Leon T. Hildreth has had an unpleasant visitation in an attack of pleurisy. He is on the gain now, sitting up each day, and certainly wishes no repetition of this painful visitor. While the congregational parsonage is empty, workmen are busy renovating several other rooms in anticipation of future occupants. Our townsman, who undertook to move a large load of hay in the deep snow of Monday, uh, we hope, enjoyed reloading on the road in the village as much as did the onlookers. Apparently, the hay load uh, slipped off the hay wagon while he was going through Westford Center, and he had to reload it in front of uh, many onlookers. A daughter, Evelyn Green, was born into the household of Mr. and Mrs. William E. Green last week, February 10, 1910, being their fifth child. The next section is called An Address. At the William E. Frost School Wednesday afternoon, teachers, parents, and friends listened to an address by Mrs. Walter Leroy Smith. Mrs. Smith represented the State Congress of Mother Clubs and wishes to organize a club of this sort here. A nominating committee was chosen, and another meeting will be held about March 1st. One of the objects of these organizations is to bring the parents and their school into closer cooperation for the best development of the child. Much interest was shown in all that she said. Hygiene, child labor, and juvenile court were among her topics. The next paragraph is the Tadmuck Club. The regular meeting of the Tadmuck Club took place Tuesday afternoon in Library Hall. It was one of the series of the, of the season's study of Alaska and was in charge of Charles O. Prescott, and the members of the club are certainly indebted to Mr. Prescott for his thoughtful and interesting account of the resources of this great country. He sketched its rapid development since its purchase by the United States from the Russian government 40 years ago, giving a most comprehensive and intelligent outline of the real industry of the gold output since its discovery in 1896, and of its other mineral wealth in coal and copper, and of the agricultural possibilities of this great rich country, which are somewhat und undeveloped. Now that the afternoon's daylight is so much longer, the time of meeting uh, uh, was voted to change from 2.30 to 3 p.m. That's the time of meeting for the uh, Tadmont Club. The next uh, paragraph is called Congregational Social. 
The regular monthly social at the Union Congregational Church Wednesday evening took the form of a concert of high order. That's the church that is now the CPA at the corner of Lincoln Street and Boston Road. The Mendel the Mendelssohn Quartet of Lowell furnished the vocal part of the music in their best form, as might as might well be with Miss Edith M. Sweat of Forge Village for accompanist. Mrs. Florence Holgate Campbell of Lowell as reader gave a variety to the program. The next section is the About Town section. Alvin Poley, it's, it's spelled P-O-L-L-Y here, but it should be spelled P-O-L-L-E-Y, who has been ill a long while, is rapidly failing, and medical authority says the end is only a question of endurance of constitution. Harold Fletcher reported ill last week while still at the hospital, is gaining rapidly, and the danger line is apparently passed. Daniel H. Sheehan has trundled his portable sawmill from Carlisle Cumberland lots to the lumber reserves around Kai's Pond, owned by Horace E. Gould. The, the winter reserves for care of the roads even up the ups and downs of the, of the situation and so lessen the tendency to lurch. I think what he's trying to say is that the snow drifts that, we've, that Westward had 100 years ago have kind of leveled off the road by filling in the lower parts of the roads. Jonathan T. Good, long in the employ of the Brigham Farm, has given notice to leave and will leave town with his family for California in early March. He was a faithful laborer. His successor is unknown. The Fortnightly Club, uh, which is the club, uh, social club for North Westford, will hold its next meeting Friday evening, February 25th. All sorts of good things, useful, vocal, instrumental, and oratorical, will be set off. William R. Taylor, uh, he's the son of Samuel L. Taylor, town auditor, is busy with department books in readiness for the annual town report. The collector's books show attention to duty, and of the $30,000 or more voted raised by the town, only a bare $1,400 remain uncollected. Can this record be duplicated in Middlesex County or the state? If so, speak up, some of you towns. James H. O'Brien is reported ill with pneumonia at his home on Pigeon Hill. If you feel a little off color on appetite, don't be discouraged. The remedy is close by. The ladies of the Unitarian Society are to give a supper and sociable in the vestry of the church Friday evening, February 25th. This, the next section is called Death. Mrs. Hannah Marie Hamlet died at her residence at Brookside Sunday afternoon, February 13th, aged 85 years. She will be remembered as the widow of Theodore Horace Hamlet, who died last autumn. She had been a resident of the town since 1848 and was born at Wentworth, New Hampshire, May 15th, 1825, and before marriage was Miss Hannah M. Jewett. Her parents removed to Dracut, where she received her early education, and in Lowell. She married Mr. Hamlet at Dracut, February 19, 1846. Two children were born to them, Emma M., who died at the age of five weeks, and Lester H., who died March 5, 1905, at the age of 54. One brother, Franklin Moses Jewett, enlisted from Westford in Company B, 6th Regiment, and died at Reedville, January 23, 1865. Uh, Reedville was not a battle. It was a, it, Reedville is a town in Massachusetts, and it's where the Massachusetts regiments trained uh, um, when they were formed before going off to fight in the Civil War. Mr. Hamlet, Mr. Jewett was well known to the older residents of Westford, being engaged in the grist and sawmill business at Westford and Brookside. The funeral of Mrs. Hamlet took place from her residence Tuesday afternoon. She wisely managed to keep clear of unwise extremes. Well, at home, spirit 
while the, home, while the at-home spirit was always strong and wisely cultivated. The larger home life of society, social and religious, met her approval and presence. This well-blending and conservation of home life and the larger life of the community was one of the strong factors that kept her interesting and youthful in spirit in home and society until the end. Next section is Forge Village. The ladies' sewing circle met at the home of Mrs. Henry Catchpole Thursday night of last week. After the usual work was disposed of, refreshments were served. The circle will meet this week with Mrs. Hugh A. Ferguson of Westford. Through the kindness of Mrs. Richard D. Prescott, the ladies will enjoy a sleigh ride. Reverend Mr. Monroe of North Andover conducted the Lenten services at St. Andrew's Mission Wednesday evening. The next section is called Celebration. The 15th anniversary of St. Andrew's Mission was fittingly observed Sunday evening at the Mission House. A special feature of the service was the singing of the vested choir of small girls. Reverend Thomas L. Fisher, vicar of St. Andrew's Parish, which includes St. Andrew's Church of Ayr and St. Andrew's Mission of this village, conducted the services. Many former residents and members of the church were present. Among them were Mr. and Mrs. Frank Hindel of Chelmsford Center, Wilfred Normingham, Normington of Worcester, and Edward Sturgis of Andover. Mr. Sturgis, while master at Groton School 15 years ago, conducted a religious Sunday school here, which has always been carried on by successive masters and students of Groton School. Mr. Sturgis spoke briefly on this on his experiences while conducting the Sunday school here, which caused much laughter. Frank Hindle was formerly superintendent of Abbott and Company's Mills, a position he held for many years until he resigned from his active duty four years ago. He was also a prominent member of St. Andrew's Mission. Mrs. Frank Hindle was a valued member of the ladies' sewing circle. Wilfred Normington occupied a prominent position in the Abbott Mills for many years and was the first secretary of St. Andrew's Mission. A brief sketch is given here of St. Andrew's Mission. I, I, I don't have uh, time to read all of it, but I will read a good part of it. The earliest records show that a meeting was held February 13, 1895. There was elected a general committee to secure the services of the Episcopal Church, namely George Weaver, Harriet Precious, Francis Lowther, Lowther Harry Lewis, William C. Precious, Mrs. Alice Carrick, John Spinner, Sarah Precious, Mrs. Hannah Wythe, Mrs. F. A. Sweet or Sweat, Mrs. H. E. Randall, Thomas Carrick, and Teresa Lowther. Uh, probably most of those people either came from England or, or their parents came from England. The association then formed. The association then formed, elected as president, John Spinner, secretary, Wilford Normington, treasurer, Edward Sturgis. For eight years, services were conducted in Abbott Hall by the generous provisions of the Abbott Worsted Company and administered by successive rectors of Ayers St. Andrew Parish. Meanwhile, Though the efforts of Saint, through the efforts of St. Mary's Guild of Young Ladies, the Sewing Circle, and by entertainments of the people, generally the sum of $2,111.93 was raised. To this was added $350 by the Abbott Worsted Company and many personal gifts, including $25 from Bishop Lawrence, making a total of $3,975.30. There was paid for a lot of land on Pleasant Street, the sum of $325, and the balance of the construction of the Mission House, which is still there now at 25 Pleasant Street, which was dedicated by Bishop, Bishop William Lawrence, October 3, 1903. The efficient and economic erection of this building was due to the faithful work of Hugh A. Ferguson of Westford and to Reverend Thomas L. Fisher, who drew the plans of the building and personally supervised the work. The care of the building and grounds has ever since been performed with painstaking zeal by William Burnett. You can... Uh, 
easily identify this building because on the second floor it has a large uh, St. Andrew's cross uh, uh, in wood on the side of the building. It's easily seen from Pleasant Street. The successful and devout maintenance of the worship in Abbott Hall and Mission House has been in large measure due the free spirit of gratuitous service by three successive organists, Miss Polly Burnett, Miss Edith Normington, and Miss Sarah Precious, and all the devoted members of the Vested Choir. The log pulpit was made by the vicar, Reverend Thomas L. Fisher, from a monarch chestnut tree grown on the Shaker Farm in Harvard, aged 105 years in 1895 and measuring three and a half feet in diameter. Within and without the building, opportunities have been afforded the village people and children in the way of a school a school garden, gymnasium classes for both boys and girls, and varied recreations of music, lectures, dramatics, fairs, and suppers. Uh, the next section is the Graniteville section. In spite of the disagreeable weather on Wednesday night, a large number were present at the Lenten devotions that were held at St. Catherine's Church. The services were conducted by the pastor, Reverend Edmund T. Schofield, who preached a very strong sermon on death. It is hoped to have a young people's choir to give special music at the evening service at the Methodist Episcopal Church in the near future, and as soon as possible the regular choir will resume the leadership in the morning. The village people are just recovering from another severe snowstorm, which made traveling rather difficult for a time. The snow roller was out once more and apparently and, and, appear, and appeared to do good work. It has been found necessary to bring the snow roller to use on several occasions this winter, and the chances are favorable that it will be used many more times before spring. I believe this is the snow roller now in the possession of the Westford Historical Society, and we're kind of ending the period of time when instead of plowing the roads, the towns rolled the snow and compacted it to make it easier for horse-drawn sleds to navigate the streets. The weather has moderated once more, and during the past few days, J.A. Healy's men and teams have been busy hauling wood from where it has been recently cut and piling it in Mr. Healy's large wood yard in this village. The work is being rushed while the good, sh while the good sledding lasts. Good sledding was uh, almost a necessity for hauling uh, large trees out of the woods. The next uh, paragraph is called Sleigh Ride. Several members of the Shaker Colony of Harvard with driver, with driver Percy Burgess and Frank Stanton enjoyed a sleigh ride to this village on Wednesday and were escorted through the works of the Abbott Worsted Company's mill here by Alfred Prynn. Uh, he was one of the uh, managers in the mill. They appeared to be greatly interested in the work, particularly in the combing, carting, and spinning departments. One member of the party, Miss Bessie Bailey, a native of Ireland, remarked that she had not visited the interior of a mill for over 50 years, the last time being in a linen mill in Belfast, Ireland, now Northern Ireland, where she was born. The oldest member of the party was Louisa E. Green, who was 86 years of age last December, and she stepped as lively as a woman of 40 and was keenly alert to all that was going on. She has been among the Shakers for over 60 years. She spoke in glowing terms of the beautiful day and the fine sleigh ride and appeared to enjoy it fully as much as a young girl going to her first quilting party. I love that phrase. <laughs> They extended a colorful, a cordial invitation to the writer and other friends to visit them at their home in Harvard in the near future. And when that event takes place, you will hear more of these very interesting people. And that's the news in Westford for the week ending February 19th, 1910. Thank you for listening, and thanks to Ryan Cousins of Westford Cat for providing technical support. You can find transcriptions and podcasts from the Wardsman at our website at museum.westford.org or visit the Historic Historical Society's Facebook page for more Westford news from a century ago. 
This is Bob Oliphant, and I hope you will join us for next week's Westford Wardsman podcast. Thank you.